Hello, I'm Reverend Sarah Scotchko, and this is Things Unitarian Universalists Should Know. Today, our guest is the Reverend Katie Scudera, the minister at First Parish in Needham, Massachusetts. Reverend Katie, what's one thing you wish all Unitarian Universalists knew? Both Universalists and Unitarians participated in enslavement in New England. Having grown up in Northern Virginia and learned American history, I thought, you know, I don't, I don't think there's any enslavement history in the North because they were the good guys. So when Blue asked us as part of one of the white supremacy teach-ins, I think this was in 2017, they asked us to research the history of black residency in our local areas and black membership in our congregations. At First Parish in Needham, we had already done some research on the topic of redlining in our area. Black residency in the town had been very low. Black membership in the church had been very low historically. So I dutifully, to follow Blue's suggestions, I dutifully put into a Google search, Needham slavery. And uh, a result came up in Google Books, which was, the 200th anniversary history of the town of Needham, 1711 to 1911, which I own. A congregant gave me that book. There's a chapter entitled Slaves. And I was like, oh, oh, I wasn't expecting that. So I started Googling around because there were two enslavers mentioned, both of whom were loyalists. But the narrative didn't quite make sense. Other enslaved people were mentioned in the chapter and formerly enslaved people. I was like, what? Like, where were they? Where did they come from then? Mostly I wanted to confirm that there were no members of my congregation who were enslavers, which in Massachusetts for that time period, we were a theocracy in Massachusetts. To have a town, you had to have a church. So we were the only church in town. So this was really in retrospect, uh, extremely naive. I was really just hoping to find out that nobody in my congregation had been an enslaver. That was my main purpose. I was like very relieved that these two men who were named in the 200th year history were like Anglican. I, in my brain, I was like, that's somebody else's problem. So I wrote to, we have a town historian, which is lovely. And so I wrote to her and it's like, I found this chapter in this book and I, I don't know what to make of it. Can you help me? But I also did some outreach to other Unitarian Universalists in Massachusetts who had done this kind of research. One of them was our colleague of blessed memory, uh, Reverend David Petit. He had done extensive research on his own family history and told me that I shouldn't be surprised by anything I found. And I talked with our colleagues, Reverend Susan Moran and Reverend Janet Parsons, who are the ministers in Rockport, and Gloucester. The Gloucester Church being, uh, you know, the, uh, the famous Universalist Church with Judith Sergeant Murray and John Murray as minister. And turns out Judith Sergeant Murray's family uh, were enslavers. I wrote to Dr. Gloria Grice of the Needham History Center and she wrote back, she's like, oh, I looked at the vital records. She's like, there were a lot of enslaved people here. In this town where the only church was a Unitarian church, who was enslaving all of these people? So a couple of them were Anglican loyalists, but then basically all of the rest of them were members of First Parish of Needham, uh, including the founding minister, Reverend Jonathan Townsend. The way we found out about Reverend Jonathan Townsend is that he had in his vital records, the death of his servant, Homer. So I actually wrote to a research librarian at Harvard Divinity School, where I'm an alum, a research librarian who is a member of uh, First Parish in Cambridge, and asked her, I was like, uh, can you look into this? Is it possible he was an enslaver? Tell and she looked up a Harvard College biography of, of him and it said very explicitly in there that his father-in-law had likely given this enslaved man, Homer, to him as a wedding gift. And Ho it, Homer is also listed, then when you dig back into that 200 year history, Homer is listed as having served as sexton of the church. And then of course they would pay Reverend Jonathan Townsend for that. When Unitarian Universalists say things like, we were historically abolitionists, how would you respond to that? So that is true, but it's a yes and because particularly in New England, which was populated, especially in Massachusetts, by Puritans, their ancestors were Puritans, they believed in predestination and interpreted the section of, the sections of the Bible that talk about enslavement to mean that slavery was okay. Because if you enslaved people, you could convert them, which is why there was no effort made in the 1700s to hide the fact that they were enslavers. There was not, in their minds, there's nothing to be ashamed of. So we had the minister who was an enslaver, but also wealthier members of our congregation were 
enslavers and they donated to the church. And so part of the foundation of our religious community and its longevity was based on wealth extracted from enslaved African peoples, particularly children. That is part of the wealth of our church community. In the 1700s, they didn't try to hide the fact that there were enslavers. But in the 1900s, you absolutely would hide that fact. The author of that history book, George Coon Clark, who is a uh, very meticulous historian, he was a member of First Parish in Needham. We know that he knew about the other people, the other enslaved people and the other enslavers. I really appreciate that you're so forthcoming about your own internal desires for this to not oh. be true and how we can overlook these things uh, almost willfully as yeah. white Unitarian Universalists. We don't want yeah. it to be so. But we don't want our uh, we don't want our founders and our 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 belief that we were the good guys. We don't want that contradicted by facts. And then there's the question of what responsibility do we have then, given that this history is real? I am not an expert reparations work. I'm just a minister, but I appreciate that there are many countries and communities that have resources that our congregation can use as we continue on this journey of unearthing this history. Right now, we're still in sort of the historical gathering phase, but we are attempting to move into what I would call sort of a, a memorializing phase. How do we ensure that this history is not hidden again? Certainly for me, learning this history about my congregation, where I am currently employed, it pays me money, that we have an endowment that helps sustain us. We have a beautiful building that our ancestors built, that we inherited. What that learning this history has done for me is remind me that even though my family, as far as I'm aware, back in like Ireland and Italy and Germany, even though they may not have had direct benefit or directly in direct involvement with the slave trade, my congregation did and the town I live in did. And that benefits me right now that this congregation, I think about this congregation, especially with the man who was enslaved by our first minister, that he was also sexton of the church. That's I like his literal unpaid labor, enslaved forced labor helped maintain the church building. And that directly ties to my current employment. I can't be separated from that. What does it mean for us as a congregation and in our town community that wealth was extracted from the forced unpaid labor of Black and Indigenous people? It's just inescapable in the United States. And the best we can do with that kind of history is instead of feeling like ashamed of ourselves and reactive to that history, is to understand that we have a debt. I appreciate that, for example, that we have tried to make repair with modern ancestors of the Ute tribe in Utah, where we had sent ministers to, Unitarian ministers, to administer the colonization and reservation process of that tribal group. And that wasn't the only, that wasn't the only interaction or displacement that we had with Native peoples. So we have work to do. We have a lot of work to do. But it's work that we can do if we accept that charge. If we accept the history and then say, well, obviously then we have to figure out how to make an appropriate apology. Is there anything else you wish all you use knew? The Twilight series has ruined people's understandings of healthy relationships. It's like the anti-owl. I also wish you used new that J.J. Abrams ruined the Star Wars series. I wish you used new that we have a thriving international Unitarian and Unitarian Universalist community. I wish that folks knew about, folks in the United States, you use in the United States, knew about those other communities and the richness of our religious tradition. Well, Reverend Katie, thank you so much for coming on Tusk. Thank you so much for giving me the time, Reverend Sarah. Take care. Bye everyone. Thank you so much.